are going to spend our time in pretty much one passage of scripture as I thought of the many ways in which the mothers that are in my life, my mom obviously, uh, Mother Loretta McBride, the mother of our beautiful children, Sharice, amen. I think my sister, she's not here. Uh, Shelly's in town and uh, all these wonderful mothers who are in my life. I am often encouraged and reminded of the ways in which uh, mothers, caregivers are often asked to give so much of themselves on behalf of all of us. And so in this way, uh, I want to encourage all of us today through this one singular passage. I think it will be a passage that will minister to all of us wherever we find ourselves in the spectrum of motherhood and caregiving. Uh, certainly it is and remains this truth and reality that although we uh, articulate God as father quite exclusively in the Christian tradition, it is uh, worthy to acknowledge that God is not a man. Amen. God is a spirit. Amen. And in as much as we take the biblical witness seriously, there are so many references of God in scripture attending to us as a mother. Um, and so it may sound radical to some of us because of the exclusivity of the usage of the male pronoun as it relates uh, to God, but it is worthy, I think, of all of us to keep reminding ourselves uh, that God is, in many respects, our first mother. God gives us all life. Mm -hmm. God reminds us through the way God gathers us uh, that God shelters us. There are passages of scripture uh, that are often used uh, where the scripture says God is like a mother hen or a bird sheltering her children under her wings. Uh, it talks about uh, God hiding us in the shadow mm -hmm. of her wings. When, when, when God is described by the prophets of getting ready to react like a mama bear and strike back in defense of her children, the scripture says that God cries out like a woman in childbirth. Or in Isaiah 66, the scripture says, as a mother comforts her child, so will I, God, comfort you. It is indeed the uh, hope of this message today to uh, give all of us a point of touch when it comes to wherever we are on the spectrum of motherhood. This passage of scripture comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And it simply says, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Man, so we are going to spend uh, this time preaching on this truth that you are more than enough. You are more than enough. Let's pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray, let the people of God say amen. I love this uh, quote that comes from Dr. Yolanda Pierce. She is a theologian, comes out of uh, the Pentecostal church, the Churches of God in Christ. She uh, served as the dean, of the, or the, the dean of the theological school at Howard University. Uh, she just got recently appointed to the Vanderbilt seminary in Nashville, Tennessee. She is one of our most important theological voices of this time. I love how uh, she uh, talks a little bit about this idea of God offering and extending to us the characteristics of a parent who loves their child through the lens of a mother. And it says this, I knew that if God was real, 
If God truly loved me as a parent loves a child, then also I must know God also as mother and not only father. Only years of dogma and doctrine force you to unlearn that what you know to be true in your own heart that demands that father as the only acceptable appellation and concept for God. Uh, I appreciate this notion that whatever you and I know about God, it is so important for us to be reminded that God, as we said last week by the passage of the I am that I am, that God shows up in our lives however God uh, decides usually in response to whatever we need. Now, how many know that God is not a one-size-fits-all kind of God? Amen. That God knows how to wrap God's self around us and cause us to appreciate that whatever we need from God, God makes it available to us. And as we have over the years gotten a fuller appreciation of the ways in which Mother's Day lands on and in the lives of so many folks, obviously many of us uh, who come to these special days, these days where emphasis are always intended to be a celebration, but at times they offer for some a point of pain or tension or dissonance, it reminds me how wonderful and appropriate it is to keep telling ourselves through the examples in scripture and our own journey that God knows how to fill every gap in our life where there is loss and deficit. That while you and I may be celebrating on one hand and someone else is grieving on another, God is enough to meet us wherever we are in our journey without causing us to have to feel as if we are a burden or as if we must sacrifice the experience of whatever emotion we have at that time. I am someone who fully appreciates that uh, I have had the ups and downs in my life and some days I'm down and my neighbor is up. And some days I'm up and my neighbor is down. Anybody ever had that lack of coordination in the seasons of your life? Amen. You show up someplace and they happy, kind of like, you know, the Warriors, you know, and the Laker fans, you know, folks be coexisting in similar spaces. And if you look at somebody and be like, how can you be celebrating while I am crying? Mm -hmm. Amen. Some of us got so emotional we had to get off social media. Amen. I heard a tweet, someone said, I don't think the Laker Warriors game is going to keep some of us in relationship once this thing is over. Hello, amen. The scripture says that we ought to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We are invited to act in solidarity with one another. So as even when I am rejoicing, I can hold space with those who are grieving. How can I do such a thing? I do it because I have the acknowledgement that God fills every gap. I may not be able to rejoice when you rejoice or weep when you weep, but I can stand in solidarity and empathy with you. Why? Because God knows how to fill the gaps that are often left by the vicissitudes of life. If you're like me, I'm glad that I serve a God who knows how to mother me in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, now I learned this first by my mom. You know, we were six of us and, you know, my mom had three of us first and then the second three later. Amen. It was like back to back. Boom, boom, boom. TJ Michael Ben. There was a three year reprieve. And then there was another three years. They were a little more spaced out than the first three. And so what I appreciated is as I got older, I began to see how my mom parented all of us differently, but never made us feel like any of us were her favorites. Although, you know, <laughs> if you ask any of us, we all would believe that we had a special place in my mom's heart. And 
I want you to appreciate that that is often how God responds to us. I mean, isn't it the case that there are moments in your journey where you feel like God is absent? Like, God, where are you? God, you know, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like this journey, this season that I'm going through. And while you are feeling that way, you're seeing other folks appearing to have great experiences of faith. The reality may not always match up with what you are hoping for. And yet through the course of your life, I do believe over time God begins to demonstrate that in those seasons where you felt I was absent, if you take a look in the rear view mirror and you're still here, you're not here by the power of your own strength. You're here because as one theologian says, the invisible God literally carried you through the seasons you did not know he was there. It is in this way that I want you and I on a day like today where we are holding space for so many experiences of mothers and caregivers and aunties, those who uh, have lost their children, those who have lost their mothers, those who have aspired to be mothers, those who are still to this day aspiring to be mothers, that along the gaps and the vicissitudes of all these experiences, God stands in the gap for us. God meets us wherever we are, and God does not ask you to live in denial of your experience in order to have faith in the presence of such a God. That God knows how to mother you. That would be the first thing I want you to appreciate today. That while we always pray our Father who art in heaven, I want you to know that God is also there to be a mother to you. Verse 8 says, and God is able to provide. Again, not suggesting that, you know, fathers don't have a sense of provision, but if you if 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 you have ever had some, some good mother, and you know, mamas know how to give you something you didn't even know you needed. Hello, somebody. Man, mothers have a way of filling the gaps of provision. And it may not be your birth mom. It may be a big auntie. It may be a big mom. It may be someone who is just figured out a way to nestle their way into your life and fill a gap. I'm so grateful that God gives us mothers in all kinds of ways. God gives us folk who know how to literally fill the gaps in our lives that are needed by a soft touch, by a word of wisdom, by a sense of consistency, by a way in which you and I can know that I and we are being taken care of. And if it is indeed the case that God is taking good care of us, then I want you and I to then ask ourselves, if God takes care of me, how then can I love on those who mother me as well? It is almost on a day like today, we should have three responses. We should have a response of tribute, a response that celebrates, a response that acknowledges, a response that uh, venerates and amplifies and elevates the ways in which mothers and caregivers show up in our life. But then we must also have uh, a response of aspiration that God, I want to also aspire to show up in the lives of those you place around me in ways that causes me to be your arms and legs in the world to fill gaps and provide other ways of mothering. Amen. There are people outside your birth family, some folks today that call it your chosen family. Anybody know what that means? You have your birth family, family you did not choose. <laughs> Somebody say amen. And then you have your chosen family, the people you choose. Like, yeah, we're going we, we to walk together for a little while. How many of you know sometimes your birth family may not always be your chosen family at various seasons of your life? But guess what? We as a church, we are called to be a chosen family. 
Let me preach about that last week that you are a chosen generation. We choose one another. We choose to be here today. None of us were manipulated or, 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 or paid to come. Praise God. Amen. None of us were forced to come. Sorry, kids. Maybe you are forced to come. <laughs> but you'll thank us later. Somebody say amen. How many know that when kids are forced to come to church, they'll thank you later? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be like, I don't know about that. I'd, I'd rather stay at home. No, no, no. You, you'll thank us later because those songs you hearing, them words you hearing, you be sleeping church and don't even know that stuff's getting all in your DNA. Uh. <laughs> you going through hard times and you ain't rapping no Jay-Z and Beyonce, amen. You rapping what Big Mama was, was moaning at church, amen. How many know them, them things you moaning in church have been moaned for centuries? Mm-hmm. Talking about a tried and true soundtrack on how to get through some of that stuff's only transmitted in church and so it is this history then of tribute and aspiration that we ought to respond on a day like today i know that human beings have not always lived up to the ideal of these titles and roles but that's why we have the opportunity to then choose through God's abundance. Because again, that is the second point of this sermon, that God always gives us abundance. Verse number eight says that we always have enough. Somebody say, I always have enough. And that's just not talking about the money in your bank account. It's just not talking about the intellect in your brain. It is literally talking about all of creation God creates with more than enough. But we as greedy, self-centered human beings always take more than what we need. But the great thing about God's creation is even when you attempt to hoard, God still gives you more than enough. And so the more than enough then is your opportunity my opportunity, our opportunity to appreciate that if God gives us more than enough, then literally you are always more than enough. You're more than enough to get through the trial and the hardships. You're more than enough to make it through the disappointments. You're more than enough through the power of God to overcome your trial and tribulation. You're more than enough to make it through that bad relationship, that fractured interaction and life experience with your mom, your caregiver, your big auntie, your chosen, well, not your chosen, your birth family. Mm -hmm. How many need to hear that, that I am more than enough? I may not have the kind of perfect, whatever that means, relationship with my child, my mom, my family, my auntie, my big mama, and yet God still gives me reminders that I am more than enough. A couple questions then I want you to think about. First one says, does seeing God as mother help you overcome the ways in which we unfortunately dehumanize women in our own society. In what ways do we need God to mother us in this season? Second set of questions, how must you remind yourself that you are more than enough? And where does scarcity show up? And how can you overcome the lie of scarcity? Scarcity attempts to rob us of the opportunity of God's abundance. Scarcity would like to focus on what you don't have. The underside of the negativity of your experiences and rob us of the opportunity to see what God is laying before us. God is always laying before us as we are still in this season of Easter, new life. 
a chance to begin again. God is always laying before us this opportunity that if I could just roll this stone away from the tomb, I'm going to peek in there and I'm going to understand that dead things don't live. I'm sorry, that uh, uh, alive things don't live in dead tombs. That if I can just see God at work, that God reminds me that there is no need to bathe and to dwell in the scarcity of my circumstance. But I can, through the eyes of faith and hope, appreciate that God gives us more than enough. And if God gives us more than enough, if God reminds us that we indeed are people who can be mothered by the goodness of God, then I love verse number eight where it says that we ought to then share abundantly in every good work. On a day like today, I want to invite all of us to commit ourselves to staying involved in the good work of being a caregiver, a mother, someone who gives and cultivates life. This idea that you and I must stay active in the good work also means that there's some bad work out there that don't require your attention. Some of us need to give the bad work a pink slip and say, I want to, I think I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a give my letter of resignation today. I'm not going to keep working in this space and place where the work robs me of the abundance of God. I'm going to put my energy in places where it's good work. And I want you to know, all you mamas in here, <laughs> it's okay for you to invest in some good work. Work that feeds your soul. Work that feeds your spirit. Work that rebuilds your heart and your mind. Work that helps replenish you. Some of us who are, are, are caregiving, standing in the gap, it's okay for you to engage in good work. Work that causes you to seek out healing and therapeutic practices. Work that causes you to take a day off and go breathe this sometimes clean air. <laughs> Flowing in off the Pacific Ocean. It's okay for you to literally pause and say, I will decenter the work that literally leaves me empty. Now, decentering bad work does not mean that you don't ever participate in it. How many know for many of us, there's some work we gonna have to do whether it's good or bad, because it's just needed. Like, oh, Lord, I have to do this. But I want to invite you to ask God, Lord, help me to decenter the work in my life. That is bad work. Help me to decenter, meaning I'm not going to have the work in my life that drains me and leaves me empty the center of my life. It will have to move to the peripheral, which means that I'm going to have to make some choices about how I structure my day and my life. I'm going to have to make some choices about my birth family and my chosen family. I'm going to have to make some choices about how I show up on my job or, you know, in my, you know, uh, 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 you know, third space, you know, my party club friends or my, my, my card playing friends or my, you know, shopping friends or my craft making friends. You know, all them people, you got friends. Shopping, I say shit, I already said shopping. <laughs> I will make a choice that I will keep up good work in my life. On a day when we are celebrating mamas and caregivers and remembering the legacy of those who have poured into us, 
May you literally make a commitment to yourself that I will engage in good work. Hello, somebody. I will engage in good work. Sometimes I'm going to have to just give you to the Lord. That's my good work. <laughs> my son, my daughter, my boo, my, I'm give you to the Lord. That's my good work for the day. I hope, I hope you and the Lord fig figure that out. I know one day I'm going to have to come back and, you know, deal with it. But hopefully me giving you to the Lord will make that day, that doomsday, that looming day, that day not be as heavy in my life. And I just think it's worth saying we have been doing this partnership at the DeYoung Museum. And yesterday we had six mothers. It was almost about maybe eight or ten mothers showed up as a part of the delegation, but six mothers who had lost their child to police violence. And the Kahinde Wiley exhibit at the DeYoung Museum, which I want to invite all of us here at The Way and those who are watching online, uh, will be there for the next five months doing programming. And it's a fascinating, amazing exhibit, 18 sculptures and paintings that capture uh, the, the spectacle of death at the hands of the state. Bodies that are just really caught in a backdrop of the Roman kind of decor. And, and it was a, a powerful day because these mothers, some of them flew in from various different states. Ahmaud Arbery, many of you may remember this young man who was killed while jogging, his mother was there. Uh, Eric Garner, uh, who was, uh, killed by the police saying, I can't breathe. His mother, Gwen Carr, was there. Uh, Oscar Grant's mother, Wanda Johnson, was there. So it was a wonderful collection of mothers. And they were sharing how they had to endure loss and grief and not lose, literally, one of the mothers said, their mind and their purpose. And one of the mothers powerfully said, I had to hold on to my faith because my faith Save me from losing my mind. But another mother said, I had to rediscover a new way of living in light of my loss and grief, and that created purposeful work for the rest of my days. The mother said, I can never replace what I lost, but I can have purposeful work in light of what I've lost for the rest of my days. That to me is choosing to engage in good work. Difficulty, tragedy, trauma, loss, grief, transition need not be something you forget on a day like today. We ought to lean into it and allow the God of all creation to mother us through the season and transform that pain into an assignment of good work. And so on a day like today, I want to invite all of us to offer tribute. We celebrate the mothers, the caregivers. Some of you who are mothers and moms and caregivers, we celebrate you. But also offer a aspiration. I want to aspire to be a caregiver, to fill a gap the way God fills the gaps in my life. And I want to make sure that no matter where I am on the spectrum of mothering, that I am tapping into the power of God that gives us the gift, literally, of choosing good work. Let's stand to our feet then and Invite some time of prayer and commitment. Grab the hand of someone next to you, amen, and, or touch their elbow if a little too, sub, too, too cautious to do that, amen, however you feel comfortable. But let's make a point of connection with those around us. God, I want to thank you. I 
I want to thank you because of the rich ways you reveal yourself to us. In Ruth chapter number 2, verse 12, the word says, May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings we have come to take refuge. Psalm 17 and 8 says, God, keep me as the apple of your eye and hide me in the shadow of your wings. Isaiah 42, 14 says, for a long time, God has kept silent. God has been quiet and held himself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out and I gasp. And I pant to show up and deliver you. Isaiah 66, 13, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. And you will be comforted over Jerusalem. Finally, Jesus says it like this. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. Jesus says, how I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. God, we ask you to gather us under your wings. Be for us what we cannot be for ourselves. Fill the gaps, oh God, and heal the hurts, oh God, and give us the strength, oh God, to keep pressing on. God, thank you for the gift of mothering, of motherhood, of being a caregiver. Thank you, God, that you demonstrate to us through your activity with us. Thank you, God, for the images, the experiences that so many of us have had by moms who have given us the best that they could and taught us, God, that there is a love, there is a presence, there is a consistency that we now can build upon and offer better to those who come in our spaces. And so, God, I pray that you will fill every gap. I pray, God, that you will bring to us chosen family that can help heal some of the trauma of our birth families. I pray, God, that we will build communities, oh God, where we can live in relationship and choose life and decenter that which causes pain and trauma and even death. And so we'll say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the person I'm touching today. Thank you that on this day, God, we are chosen to be together, to pray for one another, to celebrate one another, to be healed together, to seek your face together. Thank you for the gift of the person I'm touching. I pray, God, that you will give them every imagined blessing. I pray that everything they have ever longed for Every unmet expectation, I pray, God, that it will overwhelm them. And I pray, God, that you will give to them the blessings that only come from you. Now lift your hands where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. On this day, in this season of my life, I need you to mother me, God. I need you to hide me under the shadow of your wings. I need you to nurture me, God. I need you to heal me, God. I need you to speak softly and to touch me tenderly. I need you, God, to show up for me. Save my soul. Heal my body. Ease my troubled mind. Do it for me, God. Like you've done it so many times before. And we will say thank you, God. Thank you for salvation. Somebody say thank you for salvation. Thank you for healing. Somebody say thank you for healing. Thank you for meeting my needs. 
So bless us on this day and every day to follow and remind us, God, that with you we are more than enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them you're more than enough. Give them a high five. Tell them you're more than enough. We're more than enough.